I want you to just join me in prayer. I'll take a text in just a moment, but I want you to just join me in prayer. Let's just pray over the word of the Lord. Ask God to help something be planted in our spirit here this evening. God, I thank you for the tremendous privilege that you have given us to be here tonight and to be in your presence and to allow your spirit to touch our heart and our lives again. We thank you, Lord, for the tremendous spirit of praise and worship that we've already felt here tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in that. And I'm asking you now, Lord, to let the word be that seed, that sure seed planted in our heart this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you and uh, and uh, you can be seated. I want to, with the help of the Lord tonight, I want to speak on the subject simply this, a heart for God. We know certain people in life that they just have a passion for certain things and sometimes we say they just have a heart for that. There are people that are called to professions in life. Obviously, when we think about someone being called to something, we keep that most often in the context of spiritual things. But I believe there are people that are called to work in certain fields and that's just where God placed them and that was the gifting and the passion that the Lord placed in their heart. Maybe even as a young man or a young lady, they felt that and, and they followed that leading. And, and uh, when someone is doing what they were really born to do, it shows. You can really tell the art, uh, the artisan is going to leave a certain mark. It's not just another vessel. It's not just another day on the job. Someone that loves and enjoys doing what they do, they're going to touch you by the gift that God has placed in their heart, whatever that may be. It can be as something as rough as just framing something in or something as finite as extremely detailed art and jewelry. They're going to leave their mark of excellence because they're doing what their gifting is. And so tonight I want to talk about having that kind of heart for God. Because I believe that it is imperative that we are truly sold out to the work of God. Amen. Church just has to be who we are, not just something that we do. We didn't show up tonight to get a little check mark by our name or avoid this or that. We, we just came tonight because it finally came time on the clock for us to get here but our heart was here long before 7.30. It was a, a longing to be in the house of the Lord. I don't believe that we can afford to be, as an individuals, we can't afford to be dormant or static because the kingdom of God and the spirit of God is dynamic, ever moving, ever shifting and changing. And so for a church to be genuinely alive, I believe a church has to be healthy. And for a church to be healthy, that means the people that compose that church family have to be healthy because the church is not a foreign entity, not really. The church is you and I. And so we have to make sure that we are right in order for the church to be right. And so that's why it's so important not to cast stones or not to cast words when you sense something is lacking in the church. If you sense something is lacking, the first thing you ought to do is take a, an examination of self and ask myself, ask yourself, and uh, what am I doing to help? Am I praying? Am I lifting up the arms of leadership and ministry? Am I praying for those that are leading our young people, our children, those that are leading our music and worship? Am I praying for them? That's what we've got to first do is take some spiritual inventory because after all, we are the church. And so that brings its, its own uh, questions, I suppose, to the table. And so what are the characteristics of a healthy church or a healthy Christian life? What are the characteristics of that? You know, when you go to a doctor, it doesn't matter how often you go or how infrequent you go. When you go to a doctor, the doctor or a nurse is going to do some preliminary things. They're going to do that every time. They're going to weigh you. Amen. And you can't talk them into cheating no matter how. You can, just, you can just smile and do all kind of things and try to distract them. They won't even take a fraction of that off. And um, I'm, I'm just assuming that. 
And they're going to just do some very basic things. They're going to check your blood pressure and your oxygen level. And they're going to check your temperature. And, and they're going to make sure that all these things fall within a certain range. Most of the time, they announce all, <clears throat> all of those things. Not publicly where everybody can hear it, hopefully. But they're going to kind of just share with you all, all of those little indicators. And so... If your blood pressure falls within a certain range, they're going to probably let you know that. If your blood work shows the right levels of things that are supposed to be there or things that are not supposed to be there, that, that happens before you ever sit down in the little room when the doctor comes in because that's going to give the doctor a quick snapshot of just where we are today because it doesn't matter where we were yesterday. It doesn't matter where we were last time or last week. And it's just a quick snapshot of things overall. I realize that, that we can drill down into that much, much deeper, but they're looking for characteristics that just indicate that everything is normal. Everything is all right. In other words, there are characteristics or indicators that are just going to be there in a normal, healthy situation. I've had some procedures, as all of you have, and and uh, sometimes that's you know, not your favorite place to be most of the time. And sometimes your blood pressure's up a little bit and they say it's probably because you're here. Right. And so they didn't, they didn't pull the red alarm. They didn't, they didn't life light anything. They understood that, that it's probably a little elevated, but this is probably why. It's probably because you're in a foreign environment. You're doing something that either you've never done or you're not comfortable doing. All of those things are taken into consideration and I believe that there are some indicators just that way in our spirit man. There are just some things that are going to fall within certain ranges. And when we get outside of that, that's going to be a red flag that something is wrong. And so I believe that the kingdom of God and the work of God, I believe those that are involved in that, that if we have a heart for God, that there should be just some baseline indicators that everything is okay. There are just some things that we could just quickly do a real quick uh, an assessment. I believe that in the heart of every child of God, there should be a measurable love for the work of God. Something about how we're doing what we're doing. Just something about that that just ignites a passion in our heart. It's an indicator that we're not there under duress. We're not there because we're trying to avoid hell. Nobody wants to go to hell, but we're not here tonight trying to stay out of hell. We're, we're here this evening because we love the Lord. We love the Lord. I believe there should be a notable enthusiasm about what we're doing. I'm not talking about superficial or being giddy. I'm just talking about something in our heart that is there, solidified. I believe that our love for the kingdom of God and his church on earth should be recognizable. What we're doing is going to show I believe that we can tell if somebody's prepared to speak or somebody's prepared to sing or if somebody's prepared to, to play an instrument or if somebody's prepared to teach a lesson. All of those indicators are there. Somebody's considered this. They've thought this through. Years ago, I read an article about a man that wrote, that wrote about his very first visit to a church. Thankfully, uh, you know, there was no indication of where this church was or what kind of church it was, but he just said, when I went to the church, when I went to this church service, he said, I walked in to a very dimly lit auditorium, and he said they were, they were all gathered together, and they were singing some real slow, he said, funeral-type songs, and he said, I found them quite depressing. And uh, that was his first time that he'd ever been to a church service of any sort. Later that same day, he walked downtown in the city that he was visiting and he went past a jewelry store and there was a sign outside that said grand opening he said they had a greeter at the door to welcome you and, and, and greet you as you came in the door inside all the lights were up and the celebration was going on he said they had refreshments they were serving and, and people were having a good time and they were talking and laughing and just having a wonderful time it was a grand opening of this jewelry store and they, when he looked around a little bit uh, even though he wasn't a customer that day, they thanked him for coming by. And he said, you know, after assessing this, after having visited the church and then visited the jewelry store, if the jewelry store had asked me to join them, he said, I probably would have. <laughs> Amen. I hope that's never said about us. I hope that's never said about us. Amen. 
I'm not talking about a sideshow atmosphere, of course, but I believe that when people walk through the doors of the church, they ought to immediately realize I've walked into the right place. Now, I understand there are people that come from all kind of backgrounds and somebody may be here this evening that's not accustomed to or even all that comfortable with Pentecostal worship and our demonstrative praise and adoration. They may not understand all of that, but aside from all of those things that may seem somewhat foreign, there ought to be an underlying piece that says, you know what, I'm in the right place. I've found what I'm looking for. Amen. I believe that is with all my heart. I've often said that, that we pray over this church. Well, that seems pretty fundamental, but I mean that in a literal sense, that we pray over this church, not just pray over the building, but pray over every aspect of the property of this building. There are times I'm not alone. There are times others here that join me, not even corporately, but join me individually uh, on your own time or maybe during a service and just walk the property and pray and ask God to just bless this church and bless the day or the service or whatever it may be. And, and uh, through the years, I've had people share with me many times, many times that they felt a peace when they pulled into the parking lot. I mean, what I feel by that is mission accomplished. We got a prayer through that somebody drove onto the grounds. And that was before they ever had a chance to walk into the building, but they just felt like I am in the right place. This is where I'm supposed to be. All of those things just get compounded when, com compounded when they walk through the door. They realize more and more because we prayed over those doors and we prayed for the seats that they're gonna sit in, that they would feel the presence of God and the embrace I believe coupled with that, they certainly ought to find warm smiles and friendly people that are engaging and pulling them into that. I mean, that's what people sh should feel. I believe with all of my heart. I believe that we should love God passionately. Passionately. I believe that Jesus kind of gives some insight to that in Mark chapter 12 and verse 30. Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. And so to love the Lord with all your heart means that we should love him with a pure devotion. There is absolutely no agenda. I'm not here to be seen or heard. This is not about me. <laughs> Amen. We're just here because the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so it's not enough to just give God place in our hearts. I believe that we're called to love him with all our heart. That we would love nothing more than the house of God and the work of God. Amen. That is first and foremost in our life. And, and most are familiar with how, how it was when we met that person that captured our heart. Uh, I, I don't want you to drift too far, but you can go right back to that place where, where you met that person that captured your mind and your attention. Genesis 29 and 11, we often laugh about this, but it's truly not laughable. The Bible says that when Jacob met and kissed Rachel, that he lifted up his voice and wept. Amen. Well, you know, there's a lot of um, editorializing I could do right there, but we'll just leave that alone. But, but we remember that moment that something, someone captured our heart. He was not ashamed of the feelings that he felt. He was not ashamed of the emotions that swept over him. I believe that Jacob was a, a man's man, but nevertheless, he met something that melted his heart and touched him, and he lifted up his voice and he wept. And so being in love with someone, I believe, of course, is a genuinely exciting experience, but, but to love the Lord your, with all your heart is something kin to that, much like that. If you can love something that can fail you with that, how much more should we be able to love something that never fails? Praise God. It means that we love the Lord with all of our heart, that, that we are completely 100% devoted to him and that we are faithful and loyal to him. It means that he becomes the most important thing in our lives. There's nothing, everything else is gonna fall beneath that. He is the most important thing. But the love that we're have to have for God has another characteristic. We're not only to love the Lord with all of our heart, but Jesus said that we should love him with all of our soul. 
Amen. The soul speaks of that, the seat of our emotions, the very core of who we are. To love the Lord with all of our soul means that our love for God is full of passion. You know, I get, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I get tickled at people, not really ha-ha tickled, but uh, somewhat taken by people that are just refuse to be emotional about things of God, but they're emotional about all kinds of other things. Amen. To love the Lord, to be full of passion, to be very passionate about that. Unfortunately, our culture is, is uh, sadly growing almost more cynical by the day. There's a cynicism that blankets the world in which we live. It's, it's everywhere present. We can't ignore that. People are disillusioned by, by things and by life, and, and that cynicism is found on the job, the cynicism is found in, in halls of education and on and on that list could go, amen. And so, but if we're not careful, that sense of, uh, of being apathetic or that sense of being cynical can bleed into our heart. Absolutely it can. The definition of apathetic means to be without passion. There are people that just lose their passion for life and they're very robotic. They're just marching through life. They don't want to love again because they've been hurt or disappointed or disillusioned. But, but to never love again means that you can never receive love. Amen. We got to keep our heart open and our mind open and we got to release things and things of the past. And I realize the magnitude of what I'm saying here tonight and not trying to minimize anything that we may have encountered that inflicted wound or harm. But I've got to let go of bitterness and guile and indifference because if I hold that, it holds me captive and it holds me prison. Amen. So I can't afford to be apathetic about my love for God. I want to be excited that I am in relationship with him. Amen. There should be a passion that flows out of what we do because I believe that real love is passionate love. And to love the Lord with all of our soul means that we must have him involved in our emotions. He's involved in our life. I'm very honest and upfront about these things, but I'll tell you, we get to singing some of these songs about the Lord and his promises that are just all these songs that are just rooted in the word of God. My goodness alive, I just can't be still. There's just something that stirs in my heart. I've, I've, got, to, I've got to move. I've got to do something because the truth of God's word, as we sing that, as we pray those things, as we hear that taught and preached, it just gets down in my heart and it reminds me of all the things that the Lord has done for me. Amen. And so to love the Lord with all of our soul, that means that we're gonna be involved. We're gonna be engaged. There's gonna be something in our life. And so when you've given the Lord all your heart, it's easy to become excited about living for him. I believe that our love for the Lord begins with a pure devotion. It has to. That pure devotion expresses itself by, by being passionate and unashamed of our passion. The Bible says that, that you're to love the Lord your God with all your mind. Amen. That is a love there that is thoroughly considered. It's clear in Scripture. Amen. That the Lord intends for our minds to be engaged in our love for him. I want you to think about that, that our intellect would be engaged, that we're not mindlessly worshiping the Lord or praising him. We're not just clapping our hands because somebody else is clapping their hands. That's what I'm trying to say. We're not, we're not just singing because it's song service. We're not just doing this mindlessly, going through the motions, but that we're engaged in this. I want to thank the Lord. Amen. We talk about uh, we t the, the song we were just singing about how the Lord touched us. Amen. That's a beautiful song. I love the melody of that song. But greater than all that is the truth of the message of that song. I was shackled by a heavy burden. Amen. We were beneath the load of guilt and shame. We were right there and so we get it. <laughs> we get it. The spirit of the Lord reached further down than we could reach up. He lifted us out of the mire and set our feet on the rock yes yes we have to we have to get passionate about that because there is truth to that and so we engage our mind our intellect our mind takes us back to a place in time or maybe places in time where the Lord reached down and he brought us through and he touched us and he encouraged us he gave us a word in Romans 12 and 2 the Bible says that we are told here that we should renew our minds amen that refreshing that re-engaging of 
our mind. First Peter 1 and 13 talks about girding up the loins of your mind. You know, sometimes we get a little thrown off with the King James language, but another translation of that says that we should prepare our mind, gird up our, the loin of, of our mind, prepare our minds, hallelujah. In other words, we're told to prepare our mind for the work that is before us. Amen. In our text, we're told the Lord to love the Lord with our entire mind, a mind that is committed to the Lord, being transformed by his power, I believe that is a tremendous asset to the kingdom of God, that our mind is engaged in what we're doing. Furthermore, I believe that a mind committed to God will also be a mind uh, into which God will pour his wisdom and his knowledge if I engage in him. If I engage in my worship and my praise in my study, hallelujah, that the Lord will pour into my heart. If I give him my mind, He'll pour into my mind. If I open my mind to his word, he'll pour into my mind the truth of that word and help me to unlock the truths of his word and hide them in my heart. Amen. Think about it. We have a relationship with the God of the universe. He has all wisdom and all knowledge. And so why, why, why would I mindlessly try to praise him or mindlessly try to just go through the motions? I want to come to the house of God and I want to open my heart and I want to open my mind, hallelujah, and say, Lord, I want you to just pour into me what you will. I haven't learned it all. I, I don't have all the knowledge I need. I don't have all the understanding that I need. I want you to help me to understand your word in a greater sense. Amen. This past Sunday morning, Brother, Brother Doug Smith always does such a tremendous job preaching, of course, but oh, what a great message Sunday that truth is not on trial. Amen. Just to hear the truth of God's word uh, almost be defended, if you please, to understand those scriptures rightly divided and connected together and what a, what a barrier and what a boundary that it sets in our heart and life. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I want to give you my mind. Amen. I want to, since you have all wisdom and the all knowledge, I want to give you my mind. And so as we commit our ways to him, even our thought processes, then he will begin to impart his wisdom and his knowledge knowledge into us. I believe that all mental abilities ought to be dedicated to God. Whatever we have, I want to give that to the Lord. I don't want to waste it somewhere else. I want to give it to God. I believe that he'll show us how we ought to think, how we ought to conduct ourselves. Amen. I believe the Lord can correct us. I know he can correct us. The Lord can lead us and guide us and direct us. And I'm appreciative of that. Not only are we to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, and mind, but we're also called on to love him with all of our strength. Because you see, living for God is not just a heart that's dedicated to him. It's not just a soul that's passionate about the work of God. It's not just a mind that is thoroughly committed to the word of God. But you see, at some point, living for God has got to be lived out. It has to be lived out, not just in our heart, not just in our mind, not just in the seat of our emotion, but at some point tonight, believe it or not, this service will be over. The sermon will end. The lights will be turned out. The doors will be locked. We're gonna go home and, and we're gonna have to live out our passion for God. It's got, it can't just be locked in my mind. It can't just be locked in my heart. Amen. It, it just can't be something that I've got in my, that I'm real passionate about, but nobody knows it. I've got to live this out in my daily life. Every day, I've got to take him to work with me. I've got to take him to the family uh, gatherings with me. I, it's a daily thing. It is a very daily thing. We do it every day. Amen. You wake up and we are called on to be what God has asked us to be. Not just when we walk outside of the door of our home, we're called to be that at home. We're not just called to be that for sinners. We're not just called to be that for other saints in the church, but God has called us to be that for our husbands. He's called us to be that for our wives. He's called us to be that for our children, for our nieces, our nephews, whatever it may be. There's no point in time that we're not living out what God has called us to be. Shame on us if we're one thing here and something else somewhere else, even if that somewhere else is our own home. Amen. To love the Lord with all of our strength 
means that we love the Lord with everything we do. Colossians 3.17 said, Whatsoever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever we do, we ought to do it as unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so when we're, when we're working for our employer, we ought to do it as unto the Lord. And we ought to give them eight hours of work for eight hours of pay as unto the Lord. Whatever we do, do it unto the Lord. Because our Christian faith can be, in, in order for it to be life changing, it's got to be lived out. It has to be displayed. And I don't mean that as though we are the high water mark, but it, has, it does have to be lived out. Someone has to be able to see the church in action. It's been said countless, countless times, but it is still nonetheless true that we are the only Bible that some people may ever read. And so let them be, let them see truth, let them see honesty, let them see integrity, let them see see passion, anything else and it will not make a difference at all I believe to truly love the Lord we've got to love him in everything that we do I believe that a distinctive Christian lifestyle must be evident in the way we live our life, the way we conduct our business, the way we function on the job, the way we deal with our companions as I've said and our children, I mean you can't invite the landlord to church if you're six months behind on your rent He's probably not going to have a lot of confidence in your God. The God that has changed your life. He's probably waiting on a little bit more change. <laughs> more than one way change, maybe. So our lives should be everywhere present. In our lives, the Spirit of God should be everywhere present. Everywhere present. It's like you can't touch anything and not leave your fingerprint behind. There should always be a little bit of God left when we leave the room. Amen. <laughs> Amen. James tells us that we ought to be doers of the word. Doers of the word. I don't know if it's so true now, but I remember the years ago when the sister's restaurant was in the little old building. And um, it was just always just so packed in there. And, and if you went there on Sunday, you probably going to smell like fried chicken Monday. And I've walked in places of business after being in there. Somebody says, you've been to Sisters. <laughs> and this is all a compliment if anybody from Sisters is watching. <laughs> Somebody ought to be able to walk past us and feel you've been to church. There's something there. There's something in the air. There's a fragrance. And so I think what makes Christianity powerful is not what key we sing the song in or what speed we render that song, not the scripture we use for a text, and perhaps not even the delivery of the sermon that's being preached. But what makes Christianity powerful is when it's lived out in the marketplace of this world. That's what makes it powerful. Somebody may not understand our worship, and they may not understand the song, or they may not even understand the sermon, but they can watch and they understand integrity. They watch and they understand honesty. They understand that. The second thing I believe stands that I believe stands as a true characteristic of, of a healthy Christian life is how we worship the Lord. People who have a fervent love for God are going to express that love in their worship. Amen. And so that being said, how is that worship translated? John said in chapter 4 and verse 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth and so to worship God in spirit and truth means that we worship the true God there's something that is pure about our worship it means that our worship is offered in honesty and it is offered with integrity and you can't lift up holy hands if you don't have holy hands and you can't praise him from a pure heart if we don't have a pure heart and we can't praise him with 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 lips that are that are chaste if they're not chaste. Amen. And so it means that our worship should be spiritual and our worship should be passionate. I believe that our worship our worship should engage the whole person and I believe that our worship ought to be to some degree supernatural in nature. 
Amen. That we just get called away in the spirit of the Lord. Amen. Our worship ought to be not only inspired of God, but I believe that our worship ought to be inspiring. I want you to stay with me here. Amen. It really doesn't make a great difference when you when you come to service uh, where, where people are not enthusiastic. But it does leave an impact on someone when there is enthusiasm. And I'm not talking about Pentecostal calisthenics. I'm not talking about just doing something to be, to be seen of men. I'm not talking about just antics or no, none of those things. As a matter of fact, I strongly believe that all of our praise and all of our worship should be able to be defended by the word of God. Amen, leaping for joy or lifting our hands, clapping our hands, lifting our voice, on and on and on. Those are all defendable acts. They're all defendable actions in the word of God. Our worship service ought to be made up of people that are praising the Lord from their heart. Amen. It's not a talent show. It's not about the person with the mic. There should be a genuine celebration of victory over sin. There should be an acknowledgement of his love for us. I think it's always, as I mentioned a moment ago, struck me odd how people can be one way in church and then be, be so enthusiastic about other things outside of church. If we're going to be excited about anything, amen, it, it, it ought not be the... Uh, some of the things in the world. It's not about, about who's winning the Super Bowl or who's doing what. It ought to be about what God is doing and the work of God. Amen. I, I, I don't think that our, our church service should be solemn. I think that there ought to be some energy. There ought to be something. I realize sometimes the Spirit of the Lord is moving in one fashion, this service, and another fashion, another service, whether it's fast or slow. Amen. There ought to be something dynamic about the power and the presence of God in our praise and in our worship. I'm talking about people that have a heart for God. Amen. Doing what we were born to do. It's so natural to lift our hands. So natural to lift our voices. It, we don't need somebody to rah, rah and cheer us and beg and prod and poke. No, no, no. No, he's done too much for me. I'm not going to insult a God that has done all he's done for me by needing somebody in the pulpit to say, can I get an amen? Can somebody clap their hands? Can somebody shout hallelujah? No, I'm not going to insult God long before the preacher has a chance to do that. I'm going to say hallelujah. Long before somebody says somebody ought to praise the Lord, I'm going to be that somebody. I made up my mind. I'm going to be that voice. I'm going to be that person. Why? Because we have a heart for God. We have a heart for God. We're not here under duress. We're not here kicking and screaming. No, 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 no. I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a degree of disappointment when this service comes to an end. There's going to be a degree that said it went by too fast. It all happened too fast. Oh, my, my, my. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to Praise God. God. We work and plan and prepare for, for meetings throughout the year, Jesus. camp meetings and conferences and things of that nature. And there's one common thread that I've always watched as it's woven through all of those meetings is it seems like they're, the time for them to start is never going to get there. And then it seems like it's over just like that. Months of planning and preparation and, and all kind of effort and energy and, and it just all went by so fast. Amen. It's because our heart was there. Our heart was wrapped around that moment. We're created with emotions and emotions are good. Yes, they are. In church, I believe that we ought to be feel free to be enthusiastic about our praise to God and certainly ought to be joyful and happy. There's so much to be excited about. Truly. The songwriter just said this, when I think of the goodness of Jesus <laughs> and all he's done for me, I want to tell you what happens. It's no longer a corporate service then. <laughs> when the songwriter started writing that song, no, no, it wasn't about how many people's in the building right then because when we said, when I think, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, I had, Brother Williams, I had to get over here in this little tube by myself. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, amen, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Thank God 
for saving me. You don't know my story and I don't really know your story. But because we all have a story, it means we have a heart for God. Hallelujah. I'm worshiping him because of where he brought me from. You're worshiping him because of where he brought you from. But collectively, we are the house of God, the body of Christ, the people of the name. Hallelujah. And we have a heart for him. We have a heart for him. Let's clap our hands. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, my. Praise the Lord. Oh, we serve a God who loves us, a God that has forgiven us, a God that provides for our needs, a God that empowers us daily when we don't even think we can face the day. Anybody ever been there? We've been there way more than one time, haven't we? Didn't even know if I had the energy to step into this new day. But his word came alive because he said, As thy days, <laughs> so shall thy strength be. And on occasion, occasion, occasion after occasion, we have, like the children of Israel, when they were in the wilderness, we kicked open the tent door, the flap on our tent. Amen. They didn't know what the day was going to hold, but as God promised, there that manna was, laying on the ground, freshly baked. It's for you. It's for this day. And we stepped into some of our todays and our tomorrows, not knowing how we were going to do it. But when we opened the door of our heart, there it was. It was strength. It was ability. It was God that said, I am your provider and I will empower you for this day. I will give you what you need. And so when we think of all he has done, how can we not be emotional? The scriptures are full of encouragement to praise God. Psalms, oh my Lord, we could read Psalms from beginning to end, but Psalms 66, 1 and 2, make a joyful noise unto God all you land. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Amen. The world needs to see what we're excited about. Someone said, too often the image that is portrayed of church is a group of people having no fun and doing everything within their power to keep anybody else from having any fun either. (laughs) Man, that ought to be the opposite. Man, you're missing out. You're missing out. I'll ask our musicians to come. Amen. Lord, help us to never be betrayed to someone not having the time of our life. And we want everybody we meet to join us having the time of our life. And so when we prepare our hearts to worship and when we pray for the worship service and when we pray for the preacher and, and when we then the teacher and when we focus on the goodness of God and when we make his kingdom and his righteousness our priority, then we'll be offering the Lord true, pure worship. I'm not here watching the clock. I'm not here counting how many songs. I'm not here to find out who's doing what. I'm just here. I'm just here. Because my, because my heart is here. Amen. So if we don't love the Lord like that, then the question that has to be answered is why not? Amen. Jesus spoke to the church in Ephesus and to the church in Revelation 2 and condemned them because they had forsaken. They left their first love. They didn't lose it. They left it. Amen. He told them to repent and it wasn't real complicated. He said, go back and do your first words. Go back and do what you... you, you." So if you've lost your song... Just go back and do what you were doing when you first got the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you were jumping back then, jump now. You may not can jump as high. (laughs) But if you were worshiping then, why aren't we worshiping now? He gets sweeter as the days go by. Amen. The Spirit of God has just grown sweeter and sweeter. I'll ask you to stand if you will. Amen. It means that we go back and do whatever it was that calls us to fall in love the first time. And then we refuse, just refuse to let our love grow cold. Refuse. 
If it has, then we got to go back to the altar and say, Lord, I'm just going to stay right here till you help me start rekindling, rekindling this fire. Amen. I've, I've been so encouraged through the years by elders that still have fire in their eyes. A love and a longing in their heart. Oh, my, my, my. And so I believe that our lives should be marked by our passionate love for the Lord. It should be marked by pure devotion. and It should be carefully lived out, circumspectly walking, pondering the path of our feet, carefully but intentionally. I believe that our services should be marked with sincere, sincere worship that comes from the Lord. And these are the characteristics of men and women that have a heart for God. I close with this story. Several years ago um, in Potts Camp, Mississippi, actually some of you may be familiar with that, the church and the Wilson family. Brother Steve Wilson shared a story with me, uh, my wife and I actually, um, that they had a couple, a family, a young family in their church that um, for, unbeknownst to them, for five weeks came to every service and sat in their vehicle in the parking lot. They didn't have the courage or whatever you want to call it to come in the church. But they sat in their vehicle with their windows down and listened to every service and they had no idea that these people were there. But one day, they got the courage to walk in the door and they found what they were looking for. And the Lord filled them. They were baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> I wonder what would have happened in those weeks. I don't think it would have taken that long. If they were sitting out in their car and they couldn't hear anything going on on the inside. Amen. Not just about noise now, but they couldn't feel anything that was going on on the inside. I believe that they didn't just hear sounds of music or sounds of singing or sounds of a preacher vibrating through those window panes. No, I believe they felt the Spirit of God. Amen. The power and the presence of the Lord. Amen. We don't know tonight. Amen. We don't know. They may not be sitting in the parking lot, but they may be at home right now and God drawing them. I pray that when they get here, they're going to find the lights on. They're going to find fire in the heart. They're going to find, they're going to find something in our spirit that hasn't died, that hasn't waned. Amen. Let's magnify the Lord.